and welcome to the First Unitarian Church. My name is Tim Atkins. I serve as your Director of Lifespan Religious Exploration, and my pronouns are he, him. Welcome to the First Unitarian Church, where our mission is to explore the eternal, nurture community, and pursue the common good. We welcome you in your brokenness and in your wholeness. No matter who you have been, who you are, or who you are becoming, we greet you with love today. Now, it is a special joy for me to introduce the George Perriam, who tomorrow is celebrating a very important ninth birthday to light our chalice. Happy birthday, George. We light this chalice as a symbol uh, of our sacred time together. The burning chalice represents the light of reason and science, the warmth of loving community, the cleansing heat of justice, and the flame of hope. Thank you, George, and happy birthday. Well, imagine this scenario. It's back in the pre-pandemic days when in-person chit-chat over coffee and maybe donuts was a thing before or after Sunday service. Imagine there's a group of white Unitarian Universalists who are wondering aloud why there are so few people of color in their congregation. One person suggests that most likely UU congregations can't attract people of color and black folks in particular because, quote, they don't want to come here. The others nod, sigh, and resignation to what seems like an unassailable fact and then shift to a more comfortable topic. Did you cringe? when I told this story? Was it because you recognized yourself in one of the people in that group, all too easily resigned to thinking that people of color don't want to go to UU church? Was it because you remembered a time when those very words came out of your mouth? I don't know. Or was it because you are one of those people of color who has heard Sometimes when you were standing right there, the various justifications why people who look like you just don't want to be you, you. Well, the fact of the matter is, yes, Unitarian Universalists are overwhelmingly white. But to ignore the critical role that people of color have played in our faith over time is to erase an important part of our history. And if we don't know our history, then we may never be able to really understand why the majority of our congregations are so monochromatic. We may never understand just how much we are missing and we may never really know what to do about it. And so today, on this first Sunday of Black History Month, our Director of Lifespan Religious Exploration, Tim Atkins, and I are going to share just three stories about Black Unitarians, Universalist, and Unitarian Universalist. We share these stories today in the hope that you might be inspired to learn more about these great ancestors of our faith and about other Black UU leaders to whom we all owe so much. We'll also share some thoughts about what we as UU religious professionals have learned from these stories, the lessons they offer us today. Now, as white Unitarian Universalists, Tim and I know we must tread lightly on the ground of these sacred stories. 
And so before we proceed, it seems appropriate to hear the words of a modern day young Black UU leader offering their praise and gratitude to the ancestors. This is Tyler Coles, a candidate for UU ministry and a member of the Congregational Life Staff of the UUA Southern Region, reading their poem, An Honor and Praise of Black Rage. Deep in the shadow of night, down near the crossroads and cemetery gates, with bitter liquor and cigar smoke wafting, I greet you. Clad and white upon the floor before shrines, following the names of the ancestors being uttered, I greet you. You are the sacred and righteous rage of my people, echoing throughout time from the lands of our elders. From the depths of the ocean, I hear you now. You call out to us in the swirling winds and the clamoring of lightning and the crashing of waves and the flow of rivers and the wrestling of forests and the clouds that move across the heavens in the drumbeat of the earth. You are present in the cries of Black Lives Matter and no justice, no peace. You shimmer brightly in the flames of buildings crumbling to the ground as they are consumed in flame. And the calls for protests and direct action. And the stirring of pots, the laughter of children, and the tears and prayers of our guardians. You are black rage, holy and sacred, unbound and unapologetic. You swell in the hips and breasts, in the curves of cheekbones and nostrils, in the beats of the heart and pulsating thoughts, in exhaustion, in frustration, in numbness and mobilization in life. And you name yourself as good. Holy and sacred black rage. Be ever present in our struggle for liberation, in our work to be, to love, to exist. Guide our movements in all of their forms as we strive to be good ancestors, ensuring that our descendants might look upon our memory with favor. For you, for them, invite us to live without fear. Dear holy and sacred black rage, give life to this valley of dried bones. Move like fire upon our spirits. Stir within us now and forevermore. Ashe, so be it. And amen. Our opening hymn this morning is from Leah Morris. And this song was inspired by Amanda Gorman's amazing poem read at the inauguration, The Hill We Climb. There is always a light when we are ready to see it. There is always a light when we are ready to be it. To see the light, to be the light, to raise our eyes in the dark of night, to climb this hill, together we will. There is always a light in the dark. We are ready to see it. There is always a light in the dark. We are ready to be it. To see the light, to be light, to raise our eyes in the dark of night and be a gift. Together we will. There is always a light. There is always a light. We are ready to see it. There is always a light. There is always in the dark. We are ready to be it. To see the light, to be the light, to raise our eyes in the dark of night and be a kindness till we do what we will. There is always a light. There is always a Be the light, to 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 be the light,
Nancy Kane, who is a member of our Social Justice Committee, is here today to award the third in our 30 Days of Love Awards. Every year, from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday to Valentine's Day, the First Unitarian Church of Oklahoma City celebrates 30 Days of Love in conjunction with the UUA's Side with Love campaign. As part of the celebration, we award a Courageous Love Award to one person or group each week, doing the hard work of social justice in our community. This week's topic is Education for Liberation, and I am proud to present this Courageous Love Award to Ayana Najuma for creating What Lies Between Us with Ayana Najuma, a conversational platform on social justice. Every two weeks for the last two years, Ayana has chosen a book about social justice issues for the group to read. Whether in person or virtually, Ayana has helped to bring awareness and learning about racism, women's issues, Oklahoma history, poverty, criminal justice, human trafficking, and other important social justice issues. The tagline is, when people have knowledge, people can take action. What Lies Between Us with Ayana Najuma hosted their first community forum on bail reform in January 2020, and prior to the presidential election, launched the Make Your Vote Count campaign. In 2021, she will empower the group to address other social justice issues to create change. <clears throat> Ayana Najuma has been working for social justice for most of her life. She began her journey at the age of seven as one of the 13 original sit-inners at Katz Drugstore under the leadership of Clara Luker. And lucky for us, Ayana is here with us today. Ayana. Good morning, uh, First Unitarian Church. Thank you so much for deciding that I should receive the Courage Love Award this year. When I read the email um, letting me know that I was chosen, I couldn't think of anything that could bring more tears to my eyes, but knowing that uh, I'm with a community of people that are working daily to change the world. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Nancy Kane. I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Maureen uh, Henry, and of course, uh, Reverend Diana Davies for all the hard work that you all do there. But you know, I, anyone that knows or has been attending uh, What Lies Between Us, you'll get an email from me that always starts out with, Dear Family. And that is exactly what my desire has been uh, under the guidance of God, of course, to create a family of people who want to make change, who want to see the world different, and specifically to make Oklahoma a state that we can be proud of. Um, I started thinking about how this all came about uh, in September of 2018. And as me, everything that I've ever done has come from, from the most high. So I first thank God for the opportunity of uh, doing this work, but also being open enough to hear his guidance and to be able to go out and to invite others to join me in this quest. Each week, every couple of weeks, we read books. And then after uh, one year, we decided that we just couldn't just read books. We had to be able to take that knowledge and turn it into action. And as Nancy said, we launched our first event last year by having a bail reform community forum. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. And the Unitarian Church has a history of doing that kind of work. But I was listening to uh, something this morning that said diversity wins and inclusion matters. And that is my goal is to invite people to be a part of what lies between us, knowing that every day that your voice is important, that your actions matter. And at the end of the day, we see 
a change in society. So I, on behalf of all those that come to What Lies Between Us, I accept this award for their commitment to making change. Just one little other thing. Today is the seventh of the month. And I thought to myself, what is the significance of seven, the number seven? And it means it's God's ability to create all things that bring us to a point of completion and perfection. And that is my goal every day, asking God, how can I be of service to you in creating a society that we find that we can be proud of in the world? So thank you. Now, for those of you who have been wondering, how did I miss out on this? <laughs> Go to What Lies Between Us 2019 at Gmail and write us and let us know that you want to get involved. Uh, and then you will start receiving the emails letting you know how your voice can be heard. So again, thank you, uh, Dr. Nancy. Thank you, Ms. Maureen. And also thank you, uh, Dr. Davies, for inviting me into your family and honoring me today. God bless you. Thank you so much, Ayanna. And can we give a virtual round of applause? Thank you for your work and thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Well, I want to share a story with you now. This is a story about a man named William Henry Gray Carter, W.H.G. Carter. W.H.G. Carter was born in Arkansas in 1877, the grandson of a man who had once been enslaved but who went on to become a Baptist minister and a politician, serving as land commissioner of the state of Arkansas and as the U.S. ambassador to Madagascar. Education, political engagement, and religious devotion were all highly valued in William's family. By the time William was six years old, he was already reading classics of literature and philosophy. He obtained a doctorate of divinity, but realized that his theology prohibited him from becoming a Christian minister. Reading text by and about people like the Hungarian Unitarian Francis David and the American transcendentalist Henry David Thoreau, William realized that he didn't believe in such concepts as the divinity of Jesus or original sin, immaculate conception, or eternal damnation. His God was one of love, not cruel judgment. Well, sometime after 1918, William Carter answered his calling. With no compensation and at his own expense, he opened a storefront church in a black neighborhood in Cincinnati, Ohio, one of the hardest, sorry, one of the poorest parts of the city. He called the small congregation the Church of the Unitarian Brotherhood. Carter and his congregation were actively engaged in social justice issues in the community, offering food and shelter to those in need, teaching black art and history to the neighborhood children, and leading a march on the city council that resulted in a substantial allocation for poor relief. Within the church itself, Carter promoted meditation, healthy lifestyles, and spiritual practices like journaling. Despite the congregation's vibrant programs and engagement in the larger community, the other white Unitarian congregations in Cincinnati barely acknowledged it. The ministers from the other two congregations each paid one visit only, and they offered no financial support, but sent old hymnals and publications that were unusable because they were so out of date, and according to Reverend Carter, because they had, quote, too much Jesus in them. Reverend Carter thought he was completely alone in leading a Black Unitarian church. No one ever told him that there was another Black Unitarian congregation in Harlem, New York City, 
and that the two ministers might have supported one another. No one even bothered to let him know when the General Convention of the American Unitarian Association met in Cincinnati in 1938. And note, it was the American Unitarian Association back then and not the UUA because the consolidation of Universalists and Unitarians didn't happen until 1961. Well, that same year as the convention, 1938, a field staff member from the AUA was sent out to see what this Church of the Unitarian Brotherhood was all about. After interviewing Carter and his wife, as well as the ministers of the other local Unitarian churches, that staff member wrote back to the AUA, quote, Reverend Carter is a kind man, quite intelligent, but his storefront church is in the wrong place. The neighborhood surrounding it is poor and characterized by rowdiness. I do not recommend fellowship for Reverend Carter, unquote. And that was it. No formal recognition from the Unitarian Association, no funding, no support of any kind. The church closed just two years later and Reverend Carter died 20 years after that. In 1998, the interim minister at Northern Hills Fellowship in Cincinnati was preaching, telling the story of Reverend Carter's Unitarian Church, when a member of that congregation who rarely attended, but just happened to be there that day, stood up and said, W.H.G. Carter was my grandfather. And I never thought I would hear his name mentioned in a Unitarian congregation. Well, from there, it was years of research and relationship building that led to a day when over 100 relatives of Reverend Carter showed up at First Unitarian Church of Cincinnati, where they received an apology on behalf of the UUA and the Cincinnati congregations that had turned their backs on the Church of the Unitarian Brotherhood. And yes, the Unitarian Universalist Association wasn't responsible for what the AUA had done or not done so long ago. And the members of modern day UU congregations weren't the same people who had disregarded their black Unitarian siblings back in the 1920s and 30s. But that wasn't the point. By sincerely apologizing, they were working to redeem their ancestors. They were acknowledging collective responsibility. That apology was accepted by Reverend Carter's descendants, and it was the first step on the path of redemption and reconciliation. So as a white UU minister, there are so many things I take away from this story, but here are just a few. First, there is an opinion that unfortunately I've heard expressed by a few white UUs that our church services aren't attractive to black folks because, quote, there's not enough Jesus in them. And in some cases, that is true. But look at the case of Reverend Carter. He found the hand-me-down hymnals that the other Unitarian churches shared with him to be worthless because they had too much Jesus in them. Carter was just one of countless people who have come to Unitarianism or Unitarian Universalism seeking a spiritual home where belief in a divine Christ is not required where doubt and questioning aren't just accepted, but celebrated. When you use assume what someone's religious beliefs must be based on their race alone, we aren't just perpetuating racist ideas. We are actively turning people away. And here's a second takeaway. 
How tragic is it that white supremacy can keep white folks from doing the right thing even when the bar is set incredibly low? Reverend Carter wasn't asking the white Unitarians of Cincinnati to change the way they worshiped or to split their plate with his small congregation. All he needed was recognition, acknowledgement that he was doing something worthwhile and good. But, you know, he was doing it in the wrong place. I will say that the story's ending how the UUA and the UU congregations in Cincinnati atoned for the mistakes of their ancestors. That is a source of hope for me. It shows that redemption, relationship, and reconciliation are all possible if we are willing to work for them. And Lynn Ann Wagner will do our call for offering now. I'm Lynn Ann Wagner. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the president elect of the congregation and I sit on the lifespan religious exploration team, the welcoming congregation team and the financial working group. Every Sunday we take an offering. All the cash and designated checks from the offering go directly to external nonprofit organizations doing good work in our community, our change for change partners. This month, our Change for Change partner is Manos Juntas. Located in the southwest part of Oklahoma City, Manos Juntas offers free health education, physical examinations, laboratory testing, and medications for people who are low income, uninsured, unemployed, or undocumented. You may wish to make a donation to our Change for Change partner using a credit card through our website or you can always write out a check and put it aside to mail to First Unitarian tomorrow morning. Let today's offering reflect our highest aspirations for the work of this church in the world. So I want you to imagine a community hub where childcare, prenatal care, after school activities for children, counseling services, and even actual school classes, all for free. A place that offers job training with agreements from nearby manufacturing companies to hire their graduates. Imagine it being in an area that no one had ever really bothered to invest in. Imagine the good that it would do. It would be modern even by today's standards. I can think of so many communities where this kind of center would do so much good. I bet you can think of some areas too. Now imagine it happening over a hundred years ago, being created in a community of recently freed slaves. That was the Suffolk Normal Training School in Suffolk, Virginia. The idea was first launched by the first African American minister to be ordained in our faith, Reverend Joseph Jordan. It was carried on briefly by Thomas Wise before being led for decades by one Reverend Joseph Fletcher Jordan no relation to the founder. Reverend Joseph Fletcher Jordan was the third African American to be ordained by the Universalist Church of America. So to understand the Suffolk School, we have to understand the life of Reverend Joseph Fletcher Jordan. Born on June 6, 1863 in Gates County, North Carolina of slave parents, William and Ann, Jordan became an apprentice bricklayer and plasterer. His attendance at a Methodist church led to an early career of preaching and an appointment as a presiding elder in the Methodist church. He graduated from the State Normal School for Negroes at Plymouth, North Carolina. And in the late 1800s, Joseph Fletcher Jordan and his wife, Mary Davis, traveled to Raleigh to hear the roving Universalist missionary, Quellen Shin. Mr. Jordan was ordained in the AME church and had served the African American community of Norfolk in several capacities but he'd grown disillusioned with organized religion and uncertain about his previous theology, something I bet a lot of people on this call can attest to. Joseph, Joseph read in the newspaper that the Universalist missionary Quellen Chin would be preaching at the Durham courthouse and his whole family of six went down to hear him. Midway through the sermon, Joseph whispered to his wife, Mary, that's what I am. 
And Mary whispered back, make it too. The Universalist Church received Jordan as a Universalist minister in January of 1903. To provide Jordan the Universalist Theological Foundation he needed, Quellen Shin and the Dean of the Theological School of St. Lawrence University in New York created a special one-year course just for Jordan. I honestly can't imagine one of our seminaries doing that today. Afterward, he was ready to take a post preaching and teaching in Suffolk. He received the Universalist Fellowship when he became principal of the Suffolk Normal Training School in 1904, and he also served a congregation which had 50 families in the church school of 44. In 1909, the school had 129 students, and both the school and the church were remarkable reversals from their near-defunct status in 1904. He ran a school for African-American students when there was no such schools in the county. He overcame the difficulties of losing, losing students to the fields for part of the year, and of convincing parents of the validity of this strange universalist theology. By 1915, the students were divided in half, attending on alternate days, and at its peak, had a student body of over 300. In 1929, Jordan died, and his daughter, Annie Bissell Jordan Willis, became principal of the school, which was later renamed the Jordan Neighborhood House. In 1930, the St. Paul's Universalist Church folded due to the increase and due to the increase in public education for African-American students, the school became more focused on preschool and kindergarten. After the Second World War, the school started to provide services such as childcare, prenatal care, and after-school activities for children and counseling services. The school closed in 1984. So what lessons do I learn from this story? Well, there are too many to really fit in our time today, but here's the biggest. It's about money and self-determination. So what that story I just told leaves out is that the Universalist Church never funded the mission at the same rate as other missions. Jordan relentlessly traveled across the country trying to raise funds from Northern Universalist churches. And it didn't work. We as a faith like to claim his success without claiming our denomination's role in its failure. In a UU World article from the fall of 2017, the Reverend Mark Morrison Reed wonders about what could have happened. He writes, suppose that the funds had been forthcoming in 1911 when Joseph Fletcher Jordan asked universalists to support plans to add a seminary to the African-American school he ran in Suffolk, Virginia. The graduates might have fanned out across the South to preach the gospel of the larger hope, God's all-embracing love. They needed $6,000 for this endeavor. Jordan traveled around the Northeast in 1911 to 1912 raising money, but in the end raised less than $1,500. To put this in context, in April 1890, the Universalists began a mission in Japan. The Japanese mission was given at least $6,000 a year, often more, eventually totaling more than $275,000. During the same years, the Universalists could not raise $6,000 for their mission to the colored people. What does it suggest? That black lives don't matter. So Jordan always maintained that with more resources and ministers, the black communities of the South, as they grew to understand Universalism, would embrace it. Yet for years, he was the only black Universalist minister in the nation. And he and his family were fully engaged in running the school and fundraising for it. Imagine what could have been. What could have been if we had fully funded the mission? What could have been if we had financially supported this without telling the Jordan family how they ought to have spent the money they were given? Too often in our faith and even in our own personal lives, we will donate money with strings attached. It's actually a recurring theme in our denominational history, especially with its history with Black Unitarian Universalists and Unitarian Universalists. I used to serve on the UUA board, and during my tenure, we had the decision on whether or not to fund Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism, BLUE. And it was something that we were intentional about, getting rid of strings that were attached. It was money that was given to a group of Black UUs to use as they see fit to do their ministry in the world. And wow, did we get some angry emails from UUs after we made that decision. We as a faith have to get better at this. 
giving resources to marginalized communities without telling the marginalized communities how we best think the money should be spent. That's for them to decide because they know what their communities need most. But just because we lost the opportunity we had with Joseph Jordan and the Suffolk School doesn't mean that we can't still carry on their legacy. What would it look like if we continued Jordan's legacy and got back to our universalist roots of educational missions? What would the first Unitarian Oklahoma City mission school look like? I invite you to take some time to dream big because dreaming big is how our universalist ancestors like Joseph Jordan made universalism happen in places where no message of universal salvation had ever been heard before. And if Joseph Jordan can dream big given his life, it's the least we can do too. Amen. I'd like to invite Reverend Diana up to lead us in a time for prayer and meditation. Diana? These words were written by Reverend Bill Sinkford, who is the senior minister at First Unitarian Church in Portland, Oregon. And he was the first black president of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. Spirit of life and love, dear God of all nations, there is so much work to do. We have only begun to imagine justice and mercy. Help us hold fast to our vision of what can be. May we see the hope in our history and find the courage and the voice to work for that constant rebirth of freedom and justice. That is our dream. Amen. And now in silence and in the sacred circle of community, let us take just a moment to offer the prayers, the cries, the songs and the hopes of our hearts. May it be so. Amen. Hello, you, you family. I'm going to sing a song with you called Shine On Me. It's an amazing spiritual that anybody can sing. And in these days when the things that we're dealing with, the feeling separate and all of that, and things seem so hard, this is one of those songs that you just throw your head back, put it in your medicine kit. All you have to do is ask. And here's how it goes. Shine on me, oh, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me, oh, shine on me. Yes, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. Lift me up, oh, lift me up. Let the light from the lighthouse lift me up. Yes, lift me up. Let the light from the lighthouse lift me up. Oh, hold me close. Yes, hold me close. 
Let the love from the lighthouse holy close. Yes, holy close. So holy close. Let the love from the lighthouse please hold me close so shine on me shine on me yes shine on me let the light from the lighthouse shine on me oh shine Shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. The last story we want to share with you today is set closer to our present day. It's the story of Reverend Marjorie Bowens Wheatley. Reverend Bowens Wheatley was born in Philadelphia in 1949, and she passed away in 2006 at the age of 57 after a long battle with cancer. She served as a minister at UU congregations in New York City and in Tampa, Florida. She served in the UUA's Religious Education Department as a director of adult programs. She was an anti-racism trainer and consultant, director of public affairs for the UU Service Committee, and a program officer for the largest and most important UU funding program. She was a contributing author or co-editor of four books on lifespan religious education, congregational polity, diversity, and anti-racism theology. And she served on the board of the UU Women's Foundation and was a founding member of African American UU Ministries. She wrote an essential article on the topic of cultural racism and misappropriation. It's called Cornrows, Kwanzaa, and Confusion, and it's on every UU seminarian's reading list, or it darn well should be. But what I want to lift up today isn't the list of accomplishments and the many gifts Reverend Bowens Wheatley brought to this faith. What I want to focus on now is the way she came to Unitarian Universalism and what she found here. Like so many of us, Marjorie was not raised UU. She grew up in an apostolic church and later became a United Methodist. In the church of her childhood, she was turned off by the power that the minister held over the congregation. And even in a more mainline Christianity, she found herself questioning the theology and yearning for a spiritual home where she could ask questions without being told to just believe. Out of frustration, she abandoned organized religion and devoted herself to her career in media and public broadcasting, but in an encounter with a woman who had been the victim of a carjacking, whose eight-year-old daughter had been sitting in the car when it was stolen, Marjorie realized that she was called to something other than journalism. She was seeking a community of caring. Living in Washington, D.C. at the time, what she found was All Souls Unitarian Church one of the most racially diverse and socially engaged congregations in the country. Led there by her readings of Emerson and Thoreau and by her daughter, 
who wanted to join a church and had also been reading Emerson in school, she was surprised to find that she already knew many people in the congregation. They were active in the same social justice organizations she'd been involved in. And she found herself wondering, quote, how come all of you knew about this and I didn't? You didn't tell me anything about it. I never knew that Unitarian Universalism was this kind of faith, unquote. Well, unfortunately, when she moved away from Washington, D.C. and experienced other UU congregations, her experience was less positive. The Eurocentrism that she found in these other congregations made her feel like an outsider. And in 2002, she wrote, quote, when I go into many of our congregations at a cultural level, it often feels like all the healthy juices in my body are being drained out of me. It is impossible for many people from non-European non heritage to be nurtured by an upper middle class Eurocentric norm blessed by self-satisfaction." So why did Reverend Bowens Wheatley remain a Unitarian Universalist? Because in it, she found a reflection of her own faith, which she defined in this way, quote, it is gaining confidence through relating to others that there is a sustaining grace in the universe, a power beyond ourselves that holds us and that we experience through our relationships with others." Unquote. In hearing Marjorie's story, we are reminded that it isn't necessarily UU theology that is responsible for our lack of diversity. Too often, it is an upper middle class, Eurocentric, self-satisfied culture that turns others away. This, not our basic principles, is what must change if we are to be a relevant, vibrant, multicultural faith. And one more thing. Remember how that first time Marjorie entered a Unitarian Universalist congregation, she found a bunch of people she already knew? That's because those people had been out in the community building relationships. And it's wonderful that she was able to make those connections early on, which we know is critical to developing a sense of belonging. But how much sooner would Marjorie have become a Unitarian Universalist if even just one of those socially engaged individuals had thought to say, you know, I'm a Unitarian Universalist. I'm proud of my faith and I would love to have you come to a service with me sometime. In so many UU congregations, we find very well-intentioned white folks desperately trying to bring in more members of color by switching up the liturgy, incorporating more lively and soulful music, or hiring one black member of staff who's then prominently featured in all the publicity. But what Marjorie's story teaches us is there's another way for white UUs to help build a more multicultural congregation. It's two things, just two things. Make friends 
with people of other races and cultures. And to invite them to church. In honor of all of our ancestors, but especially today, in honor of the Black ancestors of our UU faith, our closing hymn is Breaths, with words by Birago Diop and music by Dr. Isai Barnwell from Sweet Honey in the Rock. And this is performed by Reverend Christopher Watkins Lamb of Foothills Unitarian Church. Listen more often to things than to beings. Listen more often to things than to beings. Tis the ancestor's bread when the fire's voice is burned. Tis the ancestor's bread in the voice of the water. George, would you extinguish our chalice for us? We extinguish this flame, but not the light and love and of love and community, which burns in our hearts. Thank you, George. Yeah. So if you were inspired to learn some more from today's service and are looking to find and read some more stories about uh, Black Unitarian Universalist and Unitarian Universalist, I can recommend to you the book Darkening the Doorways by Reverend Mark Morrison Reed. It's available at the UUA bookstore. Again, it's called Darkening the Doorways. And everyone on this call is invited to join us for a coffee hour. The chat, the link is in the chat. And we, it's a great time to get to know your fellow one you seers in smaller groups.
we invite you all to join us. It will get started about, let's say, 12, 10 to give folks time to um, go grab some coffee. So our closing words and benediction today is by the Reverend Rebecca Savage. It's called Spirit of Life, Spirit of Love. We have gathered under the banner of a shared faith. We are born of a welcoming grace that extends and receives love. We are touched by the ways we have fallen short of who we strive to be. And here we are reborn, forged by a greater courage. Let us move from this place, encouraged and refreshed from the journey ahead. Thank you all for being here. Our postlude is Love Reaches Out, created by the artists at the Sanctuaries in Washington, D.C. They said it's hard to really see it and the reason why we live in Don't chase it with your eyes and recognize it till it's given The world in front of me became the molding of my vision The pain that came to me is what I blame on my decisions How can I find the courage when my heart is feeling missing? How do I find a time when I know that the clock is ticking? I'm a soldier for this love is guaranteed to be my mission Wish I could find it easy like I see it in the children Hey, Looking back as I move forward, Sankofa I want a love that explodes, call it a supernova What it takes to reach the heavens, let me stand closer Put the pieces all together with is Jehovah. God is patient with a sunny plant to see to let it grow. When I love it unconditional, I learn to let it go. Open your arms, what I'm talking about. Without a doubt, I can feel the love reaching out. Love reaches out. Never giving up and keeping cool, I'm in control. My praise, I give it up, a higher power's in control. This light is guiding me, I'm armed with everything I know. This love is getting closer, I can feel it in my soul. Long as I am living, I still got the time to show. The patience that was given from the ones that let me grow. Forgive me for debating back and forth, to and fro. This love is reaching out, I'm giving it to you and yours. Walk with me in solidarity. My sanctuary eases my disparity. When I look into your eyes, I'm looking carefully. What do you know? There is me, no more questioning the things that I can never see. Touch, taste, smell, hear, no more mystery. Just the faith that's stronger than my pain and misery. I found it in myself and I will forever be. The breath of love that gave me the breath of life. A breath of life, spirits give it back and I energize. If I never take another, let my voice come and speak it out. And give you the feeling of love reaching out. Can you 
hear it. Can you hear it now? I So, 